uh, have you received any criticism from like the Bitcoin uh, maximalists and stuff like that on Twitter? Because uh, you guys are basically creating like a colored coin or something with, with Bitcoin, like the state coins. No, not, not at all. I mean, you know, you always expect some banter on Twitter, but no, not at all. I mean, we haven't really created a colored coin. I mean, all we're doing is moving private keys around. So we've, we've taken Bitcoin as it is, which has been a challenge. You know, there's, you know, I think everyone, everyone agrees that it's hard to build on Bitcoin. That's what you know, it is. Just, it is. It, the, the, the code base is hard. So, you know, I think where we've received uh, criticism, and you, you, that's to be expected, is how non-custodial we are. And, you know, I think we've tried to, we haven't tried to say we are, we're not. I mean, I believe we're not, but we've tried to be as upfront about how we're non-custodial. So uh, in our back end, the way it works is every time a stake coin's created, we on the back end have to create a private key. So um, we created, um, we actually open sourced it as well. It's called Lockbox. We've basically built our own HSM based on Intel SGX. And that basically creates a private key per stake coin. And when people remove their stake coin or take it out or you know, take it out of circulation, we use the, our HSM to prove that we've deleted it. And you know, this is licensed by Intel and we're quite upfront about how it works. And you know, so if people feel there's a risk in using us, they can, they can see what we've done. So I think, I think someone came up with the term, it might've been Ruben Sansa, but we're provable non-custodian or something like that. We're not, there's, there is a risk that a previous owner could steal the funds, but then if that happened, you would know it was us that was behaving maliciously. And, you know, we'd have to do it up front. So if we decided to steal all the money right now, we could it's just, it's impossible. We don't have those private keys and they get deleted. And if someone was to break our private key, the one we have in the end, that would be quite useless. But if we were to suddenly become malicious and work with a previous owner, because of the way the protocol works, you would know it's us that's behaving malicious. So there's quite, and we'd also have to um, work with Intel to, uh, to, prove, to, to basically break the, me the mechanism because we're using Intel SGX. So, you know, I don't think they would be, I think that's probably kind of unlikely, but you know, there's always trade-offs and pluses. So, you know, we're quite open about the trade-offs we have. And yeah, we're hoping people will build on what we've done, you know, because, you know, yeah, it's unlikely that Bitcoin's going to change in the next few years. So if we're to advance the protocol, we have to accept some of its limitations and build build around it. So we we because we we spoken with um with Wasabi Wallet guys and 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 Gibson from Condoin and we've spoken with um with Liquid as well. Um, I guess on on the on the Coinjoin side of things, I think from from my understanding from speaking with a couple of the guys at Wasabi and that their their like primary view or vision for the future would be everyone by default utilizing Coinjoin. Um, and actually becoming cheaper than um, than not utilizing CoinJoin when it comes to transactions. So it becomes cheaper and it becomes more private. That's their kind of future dream or goal. I get. Would you say that for yourselves, your future dream or goal would be like wallets by default, uh, utilizing um, state chains and utilizing the CoinSwap feature, and like people by default, you know, having it as an option within most of the top wallets, and and have it becoming the norm? Is that kind of what you? Would, is that kind of the, the goal that you think you, you want to go for? Like you, you think other companies well, the, the, would well, help? Well, first of all, there's a, privacy via coin swaps and coin joins are very different. So yeah, when, when you do a coin join, you essentially on the Bitcoin blockchain, you have this one Uber transaction and basically your history is kind of merged into that one transaction. Now the challenge there is, you know, exchanges can just say, well, you've participated in the coin join, your money is useless. So you do have this issue that with coin joins, you could create these, you know, two tiers of Bitcoin, you've got, you know, nice, clean KYC, <laughs> OFAC compliant Bitcoin and, you know, coin join. And we don't do coin joins, we do coin swaps. Now, coin swaps don't create an uber massive transaction. They essentially swap the history. So if all, you know, if me and you and say uh, a North Korean person was to swap history, one of us may end up with that dirty coin. So the benefit is that it's, you know, it's harder for, um, exchanges etc to pick up a coin swap but someone could end up with that dirty coin now what we do is we basically take a hash you know we basically attest every coin swap we've done into the bitcoin blockchain using something called mainstay which is a protocol we wrote which is very similar to open timestamp so 
if a coin swap was to happen and you ended up with the dirty coin, you could say, well, I'm not a North Korean dude. <laughs> I, uh, I did a coin swap on this day and I can prove it on the Bitcoin blockchain. And honestly, because coin swaps is quite new, we don't know how to react to it. Are they, and, and there is always that risk you end up with a dirty coin, but I would say the risk is minimal. And you can always then do a coin join afterwards or put it through a lightning channel. But um, so I think there's some, you know, to say that coin join or coin swap is one is better, they're different. There, there's different risks in both. But do I see all coins being coin joined or coin swapped? I don't know. <laughs> It's, it's, it's quite hard to tell right now. And, you know, you're always playing this kind of cat and mouse games with you know, the exchanges, the chain analysis of the world. And Lightning's only going to make that even more messy, which is a good thing, to be honest, because you want to mess, make their jobs happy. And funny, I have spoken to the chain analysis guys, and they want us to be doing this privacy stuff. You know, in a way, it kind of keeps them, in, keeps them busy anyway. So it's kind of like a game you're playing, which is, I think, it's one of the fun stuff around Bitcoin, you know, kind of playing this game of like cat and mouse is, is fun. I think Nicole's already answered my question I was going to ask anyway, which is um, how resilient is um, Mercury, you know, against um, coin, um, um, coin tracking firms like Channel Analysis and the, and the likes. So is it, do, do, uh, uh, you know, users of Mercury Wallet, you know, do they have the full confidence of, you know, Mercury that they are, you know, fully covered or like you explained, there are some risks or can you, you know, is there any more that you can explain? Well, I think if I'm 100% honest, I, we're not big enough for chain analysis to even pay attention to us. But I think once they start looking at us, then it, you know, that will be a challenge and it's going to be work in progress. So at the moment, there's no on-chain paint of a, it's impossible to see that a, a coin swap happened, but we do take a fee. So chain analysis could look for that fee we take. And that's why we're looking at a lightning payment to basically take that up front so there wouldn't be a fee. So if people were to come to our wallet and basically buy the stake coins, which essentially be like buying an empty open dime, that would happen off chain. It could happen with a, a lightning payment. And then once they put their Bitcoin in there and do swaps and then come out, I think that's going to be very hard for chain analysis firm to detect. I mean, the only thing they would be able to see is that we have fixed nominations. But are exchanges and chain analysis firms going to penalize everyone who has a, a 0 0.001 fixed nomination? I mean, and also we can always start changing up the denominations. We can have um, 0 0.123 or something, which I think some of the coin swap, uh, coin join people are already looking at doing. So I think once we take lightning payments up front, we essentially would have no on-chain tape. That's my feeling at the moment. And, uh, I, I hope, I mean, I'll be honest, I hope we become big enough where we are a problem for chain analysis and then we, we can readjust and, and, and play the game. Yeah, so. yeah I, I think like uh, that's, you know, one of the biggest challenges of people actually adopting. I think like, I think there are two reasons why people refuse to, you know, be more, yeah. you know, privacy oriented, which is one, they do not, you know, they do not care, they do not give a shit about privacy. They're free to, you know, hand over all their details to, Whoever you know, whatever big corporation asks of it. And second is that um, it's the complexity of using you know privacy enhancing tools. Like um, at I, at the moment, I don't think there is any um, mobile friendly um, service wallet for you know please like me um, who well, wants okay, to you know. So we we yeah. I mean we like, we spend a lot of time. I mean we didn't design the UI because if my team designed the UI. It would it looked like Electrum, which as you know, is not easy to use. But um, so we did get like an external the UI designer, but what, and you know, I think the UI is good, but one of the issues we've found and something we need to improve on is a lot of people, times people think our server's down and um, we find out it's not down. It's just Tor is being Tor. Tor could be DMD, DOS, Tor is running slow. So we're gonna make some enhancements to actually show to the user, look, you know, the wallet's not down, your funds are safe, it's just Tor's running slow. And yeah, I think making things like that more verbose would help. I, I do think Samurai runs, runs on a mobile phone, but I, I'm, I'm not sure now. I think it's Android based. Although yeah. I think, yeah. But yeah. yeah but it's pretty complex. I've tried, it I've tried using it a couple of times and it's, it's, you know, does my head in. I'm like, uh, I just give up, you know, halfway. And, um, and I, 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 I guess this is, I'm, and I'm pretty, I'm one of those people that, you know, I'm, I'm not, totally you know, newbie when it comes to stuff like this but it starts hard when someone like me who is 
who you know talk, wants to be who wants to go private but finds it difficult to use tools like samurai even as friendly you know user friendly as they claim it is but this is where this is the current state it is in right now so i i'd yeah, be interested in your feedback on mercury because we did we you know we did try and make a big nice react based wallet made it for, and we, we've got a demo video on our twitter handle which if you i'd be curious because we, we we did try a hard to make it user friendly because the first time I used Wasabi, I struggled, <laughs> and I'm a, <laughs> and you know, and it was nothing against Wasabi. I, it's just a very complicated thing to do, and then you know, the wallets jam, and I probably was critical of Wasabi, but having built a privacy wallet, now I totally get why privacy wallets jam. It's probably ninety nine percent of the time it's it's Tor jamming, yeah. So I mean, and, that, and that's what we've tried to do. Um, yeah, I think. The problem with us is this concept of moving private keys. A lot of people, it's like quite weird. And, you know, we, we, but so far, I think people have found it quite easy to use. But again, you know, we've, we're in beta, we're still ironing out little bugs. I think the Tor issue for us is the biggest challenge. It's like if the wallet freezes up, you know, you haven't lost your coins, it's not that the server's down, it's because Tor. And, and we're looking at doing alternatives to Tor, like using like more maybe more reliable protocols like I2P, et cetera, and maybe giving people the option to switch. But I think, yeah, it's it's one of the um, our initial users, which was from Ruben Sanson's group. He basically created the state chain torch. And you know, if you go on Twitter, you see people being passing around a bit like the lightning torch. And it's been very interesting to see different people use it, you know, people from whose, whose English is not their first language, people that have never used a Bitcoin wallet. And it's been quite good feedback in terms of and I think people find the wallet easy to use, but maybe we haven't been giving enough tool tips, enough uh, explanations of like why this is so. But yeah, that's 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 our job to do, I guess. But yeah, it seems to be it's definitely much easier to use in the last six weeks. I think we've improved it a lot. I think people are finding it easier to swap, and yeah, people like the fact that you're not penalized if you screw up a swap. You know, they are free. We have this feature where you can just leave it in auto swap throughout the day. So we've tried to make that as simple as possible. So I, I, yeah. But I, I agree with you. I mean, privacy does, does need to be improved, and I think maybe other protocols do that slightly better than us. So, you know, and I did look at. You know, I'm, I'm quite open-minded. I did look at the way, say, for example, Tornado Swap works on Ethereum, and you know, whether you like Ethereum or not, that's another question. But you know, it, it does make privacy quite easy, and we've you know we've looked at a few of those concepts and put that into Mercury Wallet. Something that's um, that I always think is an interesting question to ask and we get a lot of different answers because because bitcoin privacy is a very difficult thing to work on it's a very complex and difficult thing to get right and because it's not baked in at the base layer right uh we're often talking to you know super intelligent people who are trying their best to create user-friendly solutions uh to make it easy which is very hard mm -hmm. uh, as you definitely will have experienced and are experiencing mm -hmm. so i the question comes is you know what a why why decide to work on bitcoin privacy um when there are different uh, cryptocurrencies out there that are, you know have privacy sort of baked in at the the base layer like monero for example what what is it that uh for you wasn't you know wasn't right uh, or, or meant that you didn't want to put your time into or you know what did you see as an issue with things like monero and zcash and other things that have sort of privacy baked in um why is it that you decided to go for uh, creating sort of privacy solutions for bitcoin uh, instead well i think there's always trade-offs so you know bitcoin you know it doesn't have privacy at the base layer but the benefit is auditability you know i you know i i like monero i studied it quite a lot but we don't know if there's an inflation bug there and you know i think the you know the people who designed bitcoin originally that they, they made the right trade-offs in, in putting privacy as a second layer but, you know, I think if Bitcoin is to be more usable and, you know, privacy is not just, I, I speak to a lot of institutions who want privacy in Bitcoin as well. You know, this is, you know, when Liquid came out, you know, a lot of institutions were looking at it as a settlement layer using confidential transactions. So I think it's one of the, the holes in Bitcoin that needs to be answered. And a lot of people will be satisfied with just using Lightning. I mean, Lightning is fairly private. I think the issue with Lightning, I think, is we just don't, you know, if if there's only one or two Lightning hubs in the world, maybe it's not going to be that private. But at the moment, if you have a quite a big decentralized network, it probably will be. 
And I also thought, you know, the state chains idea kind of gives you a bit of scalability. I mean, I think moving chains off, I, there's a lot of use cases that I think are going to come out of state chains that we haven't thought about. But having this virtual open dime, I, I found it quite fascinating. And, and to be frank, I, what is, if you're like Bitcoin, what are the interesting things to build? I mean, Lightning's going in a good direction. I mean, we built side chains. That's without knocking other people that are still working on that. That hasn't really taken the world by storm. And, you know, if you look at the privacy stuff, it's interesting. It's, it's moving. People are, people are using Wasabi, Samurai, and Join Market. If you go to a BitcoinKPIs.com, there's significant volume. It shows that there is a demand for that. And I think now there's a demand to make that easier to use. Gotcha. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, uh, to conclude, I suppose the answer, the big, the big points are I kind of that, you know, well, the demands in Bitcoin and, and, and mm -hmm. therefore you're going to want to build solutions for Bitcoin. Uh, and also that, you know, the, the, the lack of privacy baked into layer one is, is a, is a, feature not a bug right i guess it's, like, it's not a bug it's a feature it's like kind of joke answer but it, that is kind of true so um it's easier or it's, it's probably more suitable to build layers upon bitcoin um, mm -hmm. just like there's layers built on the internet for example and um uh, rather than have everything baked in at the base layer um okay no i i, I think that's a pretty good answer because i remember we spoke to jack mazuko about it and he was somewhat critical of having privacy baked in the base layer went into quite a good answer about it as well and, and why he saw that as an issue um but well but all, people sorry. the thing that people worship most about bitcoin is it's you know 21 million and i mm. think anything that would potentially damage that is, is probably not going to fly anyway and you know i'm a fan of monero but you know monero we don't there has been inflation bugs we don't know if there's one right now also that wherever there's a plus there's a minus you know monero is working well because it has very little volumes but you know potentially having these you know, very large signatures, which is the way they achieve privacy with the ring signatures, that's potentially a bigger scaling issue than Bitcoin. Yeah, so. Nicholas, I wanted to ask you, why do you think that state or side chains, I'm sorry, side chains uh, haven't really taken off? I mean, it's a combination of things, I think. Um, whether you like the other blockchains or not, you know, it's very hard to build on Bitcoin, you know. Other blockchains, you can get a bunch of inexperienced people to knock up some JavaScript, a website, and before you know it, you've got a DeFi protocol worth a few million dollars. Bitcoin's hard to build on. I mean, it, it hasn't been easy. When we worked on the side chains, the issue was always exchanges. Exchanges didn't really want to support a Bitcoin side chain. They, they liked running an Ethereum node or, or whatever node, and they are the gatekeepers of, of the ecosystem in a way. And that was the, my experience. I mean, if there was a nice kind of JavaScript type language in, in, a, in, a, in a side chain, could that change things? Maybe, but there were attempts before Ethereum to do this on Bitcoin, if you guys remember Counterparty, but they didn't really have the marketing arm of a lot of these other blockchains. I mean, let's, call us, let's say it is what it is. But, you know, because I often tell people, well, you know, we had NFTs on Bitcoin before. Do you remember, if people remember the rare Pepe's, you know, Tev obviously was on Bitcoin before, but for a combination of marketing, uh, user, user tools, and you know, lack of demand, really, to be honest.